so let's begin. I'm not going to, to make any introduction because I did it for, um, for our VT and uh, you know all about IPP training course on leadership, etc., etc. So let's go straight to the point. But before that, perhaps we should introduce ourselves to allow our VT to know a little bit more about you. Let's begin yeah. this time. <coughs> my name is Viviana Armada. My background is uh, management. I work for the uh, board of the auditors. Okay. My name is Dulcinea Bent. My background is in political science and I work in the Ministry of Education and Sport. My name is Deborah. My background is the management. I work in this of finance and planning. Hi, my name is Alcide Alfano. Uh, I'm specializing in international trade and I work as an economic consultant at the Strategic Policy Center of the government. Hi, my name is Lucy Fonseca. Uh, Alcide and I are actually uh, colleagues at the Strategic Policy Center. And do you do this purposely? Women sit on one side, men in the other. Let's check it. I just know. I just know. It's all planned. Just learning, you know. It's, 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 it's how it used to be in Cape Verde. Uh, so, casual, not fun. So I'm Alexan Josh. I work for SOS Children's Village. You work for SOS Children's Village. Okay. Yeah. It's a non-profit uh, organization. <coughs> it's working in 133 countries all over the world, including the US. Hi, I'm Bernardino Gonzalez. I uh, start uh, my uh, new job in the national program against poverty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in one uh, program named Opportunity. I'm serving microfinance and entrepreneurs. <coughs> Hello, uh, I'm Hernani Suarez, and I'm a lawyer and a legal advisor. Okay. Uh, my name is Victor Constantin. I'm CEO of Avaco. It's an enterprise to provide services about coaching, about uh, management, uh, more about training, uh, some ac and accountability. I'm a private set, I'm going to talk for a private set. Very good. Well, thank you for uh, having me. I, as I'm sure Victor shared with you that I'm in politics, and I think the reason I'm here speaking to you is because I, too, uh, was born in the Cape Verde Islands. Um, I assume you know that, and I, maybe you've told them that I was born in Brava, um, came here, at, came to the country, United States, at six months old, and have been... Um, you know, just I'm the youngest of seven children. Uh, my oldest brother is uh, Professor Donaldo Macedo, uh, and you're probably asking, well, Donaldo Macedo, why are you D. Macedo? Um, just, and I'm sure you all know that, you know, from when my parents came to this country, at that time, they were, uh, they went through immigration. And so, just as we all know, D. Macedo is of Macedo, and but they, when they saw that together, immigration just put it together, and so that's the way my parents did it. Of course, my brother was older and um, understood the language and was able to explain to them that we are, you know, that he is, you know, Donaldo of the Macedo family, so it was Macedo. So uh, oftentimes people ask me that, so I just, for, for clarification, um, many people do know my brother because my brother Donald has been very active um, in the Cape Verdean community. Um, he has worked very hard um, in trying to assist the Cape Verdean community, especially in the field of education. That has been his, his background. Um, he's been, you know, he, he's been very successful. I, being the youngest, um, uh, wasn't the smartest, so I went to politics. No, just kidding. Um, but I, I really didn't get into politics. You know, when I got into um, the world of politics, it, it wasn't because I was deciding to do political science. That wasn't really what I was thinking about. I was a small business owner. When I went to school, I went to college, I went for business administration. That was my passion. And frankly, to be honest with you, in many ways it still is my intrigue and passion because I believe that if the economy is doing well, we all do well. I think that if I'm successful and you're successful and you are doing well, what happens is we are producing, we are making money, we're making money, we're paying taxes, and if we're paying taxes, then we can provide services and assist people and try to, um, and try to, to help. So that's been my philosophy. Um, 
going forth. But then again, as a small business owner, that's really what drove me into the political process. I, you know, as a business owner starting, and I have a small gas station. It's not a glamorous business. It is a business nonetheless, though. And it is the challenges of operating and keeping a business afloat are challenging. It's not easy, uh, you know, in my experience. And frankly, what got me to start getting involved in politics is because people started telling me is that if you want to make a difference, you need to get involved in the political process. You need to start doing things. And I did it just as a, uh, at, at the local level, at, at, literally at the town meeting level. So I started to do that. And what fortunately over a period, I started to become you know, successful in that realm. And people were said to me that, geez, you should consider moving to the next level. And I'm thinking, what do you, I mean, I'm just a small business owner. I own a gas station. And that was my focus is more of a frustration of trying to survive in the business community um, and trying to make my, my voice heard to those in government about the challenges. And that is what got me into the political realm. And so here I am, 32 years of age at the time, and decided that uh, in 1990, uh, 1997, going into 98, that I was going to run for state representative uh, in the Massachusetts legislature. And for those of you who don't know Massachusetts legislature, we have 160 members in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. We have 40 members in the state Senate. Um, and then, of course, we have the, in it, we have the governor. So we have the, uh, the House and the Senate, and then you have the, you know, the, the governor. I, um, so I have now served for 16 years in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. I mentioned the state Senate because, for those of you who don't know, I'm actually leaving the House of Representatives and I'm going to be running for state Senate. The difference is in the House of Representatives, you represent about 40,000 people. Is as a state senator, it's more, it's closer to 170,000 people. So I'm going to try to expand, you know, my re representation. And again, it's been a a progress, but uh, a progression. But going back to uh, the what got me involved was my business background. And then you have to to be successful in politics. It's the basic basic sense of campaigning. How does one campaign. What is your message? What are you trying to relay? And how do you get people to vote for you? Well, I had one small advantage that I think that most people probably don't, which is that I shared with you, I'm a small business owner, and I owned a gas station. Well, in the suburban part of Massachusetts where I live, a gas station is a very popular place because everybody, if they want to go somewhere or go, they need gas. And so I, over those years, built a lot of relationships with a lot of people. And it really wasn't because of my politics or what I believe politically, it was my relationship and relationship with people and how you built relationships. Um, in Massachusetts, we have a two, for the most part, a two-party system. We have Republicans and we have Democrats. And Massachusetts, a predominantly Democratic state. However, in the suburban areas, um, there it's more conservative. And so in that area, there's there are more, um, uh, I wouldn't say more uh, Republicans than Democrats, but oftentimes the people that were considered unenrolled, and have you ever heard that terminology, unenrolled? Anyone here? Mm -hmm. You have Republicans and Democrats and those people that are unenrolled, they're saying that you know, I'm neither a Republican or a Democrat. Well, in Massachusetts, that's very prominent, and the, the large majority say that they're unenrolled, and so they don't, they don't say they're Republican or Democrat. And so when I ran for office, I was able to make the case um, that I was going to represent everyone, and that I, you know, it wasn't a party affiliation. It was more a personal, a personal relationship, and a, um, and working for people. I think one of the things that helped me is that I, I, I that I've always said that if you want to lead, you, you first need to be able to serve, and so. If you're not willing to serve people, then it's hard to get people, in my opinion, to get to, to follow you. If, and again, it's different management styles, it's different leadership styles. For me, I've always felt if you can be a servant, you can be a leader. And that sounds, to some people, how is, how is that? 
Well, people will entrust, in my opinion, people will entrust you if they know that A, you're one of them, and B, you're willing to serve them, as opposed to a lot in times in politics, people want to be served. They want, they want the title, they want the, you know, the influence and the power, and um, for me, that's never really what drew, drove me. I, I, you hope to, as I said, why I got into politics was because I, I wanted to make Massachusetts, where I live and where I've invested my business, my family, everything, I wanted to make the climate a more economic, e economically friendly climate um, for the business community um, and wanted to share my perspective as a small business owner of those challenges that I faced. And that is what, is what I tried to do. And now, of course, as I said, I've had the opportunity for 16 years. You have elections every two years. So I've gone through eight elections. Um, and I've been very fortunate that I've had a lot of support. And I think what has assisted me in that support is that my attitude has never been that I've arrived and I know more than everybody else. But really, I've, I'm here, and I'm here to serve you as, a, as your leader or your voice on Beacon Hill and your voice in government. And my, and my goal is to get input from you, my constituents, as best, as best we can. And because when you represent 40,000 people, you can't get information from all 40,000 people. But you can get a sense and a feel, and you need to be... You, people need to trust you, to trust that your motivation isn't about yourself, but it's really about your community and the people that you're going to serve. And so for me, um, that's, that is what I've tried to do in my role um, in politics. Not always easy. Not always, you know, to, it, it's not always easy to get a sense of exactly where people are. There's a lot of different issues. And so I often like to say that, you know, the reality is, is that at the end of the day, you still have to do what you feel is you're, you're comfortable with. You have to, you have to, you can't just be, you know, as I, as I say, you put your finger in the air and see where the wind's blowing. You can't really do that um, in politics. You have to have some level, people need to know that you have some level of conviction and you have some, something that you believe in um, and, you know, principles that are important to you. Um, but you need to do it in a way that you can listen to others. To others, that, for me, I believe has helped me become very, very successful in the political sphere in my small little world. Now, I, I know many of you are from the Cape Verde community, and so you, you know, and Victor was sharing with me, and how does that affect in the Cape Verde world? For me, I'll be honest with you. When I got into politics, there wasn't a large Cape Verde community, so my relation, my my uh, Cape Verde uh, connections, relationships didn't necessarily help me in the world of politics. However, once I got elected, it enabled me, I think, to help build a relationship that I had, that I have from, by birth, by the fact that I'm Cape Verdean, that with the Cape Verdean community and help in many ways to try to build, build that relationship. Um, I, I think for any of you, you were there the other day, but for uh, Avandro who, Cavallo, who was just recently elected. Now, Avandro, in, in the Boston area, there's a very large Cape Verdean population there. And I often was frustrated as, as, as someone in politics to say, geez, when you know that we have areas where we have large Cape Verdean populations, we should have a Cape Verdean person representing that area. And we had not seen that for many, you know, for, for years. And I, I think that, you know, at, at the time, I was the only Cape Verdean born legislator in, Ma in Massachusetts, and I say Cape Verdean born, there were a few other Cape Verdeans, one from, that was way on the Cape, um, but she was not born there, and there was another gentleman from New Bedford back in the 70s, but he too wasn't born there. But I was born there, and what I've seen and what I'm encouraged by here in Massachusetts is the first time that we saw the Cape Verdean community come together and understand the importance of um, having to be in, the importance of being involved in the political process and encouraging and getting behind someone that shares their culture, their values, um, and uh, and has um, and can be a voice for the Cape Verdean community, and, and in many ways um, 
can be an example to the Cape Verde community of what can be accomplished in what I believe is you know, you know, one of the greatest nations on earth. I am thrilled. I, I am Cape Verde. I love who I am, but I am very, very much uh, honored by the opportunity that I have to serve uh, in the Massachusetts legislature and, and be here uh, in, in America. And so um, it is exciting to me when I see a, a, a Vandro, um, and see the Cape Verde community rally around um, one of their own because I think that he will give, uh, he will, ha he has a lot to offer and he will do a lot for the Cape Verdean community, I believe. Um, because, like anything, even for myself, I may have been Cape Verdean, but a lot of Cape Verdean, yeah, but you're not, you know, you don't live in our community and whatnot. There wasn't that, that personal relationship that I wasn't a neighbor, I wasn't you know, dealing in, in, in the same type of, uh, same type of circumstances. And so for Avandro being, you know, right in the community, having his, having his Cape Verdean community come around him is a very, um, is a very good thing for the Cape Verdean community. And I think it's going to grow. And I think we have areas um, that we're going to see in, in Massachusetts as a whole where we can have others be more involved. So to that extent, I really feel like we've made some significant um, progress, you know, at least for the 16 years that I've been in the world of politics, for us, the Cape Verde community here in Massachusetts. And um, just as I, as I go forward, I, I, I oftentimes like to get a sense from you what you're more interested in discussing or asking me about in policy. I mean, I can talk a lot about, you know, what I've done, what I've done, and how I've gotten there, how the process works. But I would like to start to turn it over to you to ask me possibly some, you know, what you know questions that might be interesting to you, so that I can keep on topic that would be interesting to you. Um, hearing from somebody who's been, you know, who's Cape Verdean born, uh, who grew up in a very, you know, Cape Verdean culture. As I said, I was the last of seven children, so I grew up um, speaking Creole at home. I, uh, you know, my you know, was very, you know, active in my own, in the family circles in the Cape Verde community. Um, I, I know you're probably going to be asking me to speak Creole, it's been a long, you know, I, when I was a, a baby, we, or I was a kid growing up, we would speak it all the time. But, you know, Creole, come with the bumpa. Say, mess, so get the barbecue with the bumpa. Me tentende, me tentende, um pouquinho, um pouquinho. Tudo curto. Tudo curto. Não tinha até chão. Mas de mas bom de bravo, de outro e eu me entendo tudo. But I, I um, as I said, I, I'm going to hopefully turn it over to you to ask you if you have any questions uh, of me, and I'll give you, you know, I'll give you my perspective of um, how, you know, how one, if you want to be in le any leadership position or you want to be in politics or you want to be successful in whatever field I give you how I think I've done it I can't say that I've you know been overly successful but I you know I've been fortunate to continually get reelected although it could be the end pretty soon I'm running for state senate so a lot bigger district we don't know what will happen so if anybody here have a question of me um, in regards to what I do okay. go ahead what Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> One uh, will go ahead. Okay, good. And uh, another. Okay, Jocelyn. Yes, thank you, Mr. Macedo, for your explanation. I can make it three questions to, to make that. I, oh, wow. I can choose one. I can choose one. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, we can go back if we yeah. go back and yeah. forth. So yeah. we'll, we'll okay. just go back. So if you get three, yeah. you, you two are the only ones ask questions, so you probably get that. So. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Um, you said the people tell you the way our success is involved um, a political process. Now you feel is you agree with this argument? Excuse me, I'm sorry. The, the way to to our success is involve a political process. Now you feel this is agree. You could, it was you agree this argument? I wait. I'm missing. Wait, wait. No, she she said the. You said to, 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 be, to be successful, you need a political, uh, uh, correct, uh, just Selena. Okay. You, the question is that, that for success, you need to be politically involved. Someone told you before you, you were in politics. Maybe they said to make Your experience. <laughs> okay, I get, I get it now. Okay, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I'm just, okay. So, so, 
if you choose the world of politics, you need to be involved in the political process. So I chose the world of politics, so yes, I needed to be involved. As a small business owner, I didn't think that being, I didn't think about politics, I thought about business, so it wasn't there. I started to understand that if I wanted to make a difference, I needed to be involved politically. And, and po politi political is more Republican, and it's not that. It's, it's being involved in your community. It is, if you want to make a difference in your community, you have to be involved in your community. You can't complain about things that you don't like if you're not doing it. Does that make sense? So I think political is... It's more the terminology than it is the you know than it is the it's it's being involved in the body politic and being involved in what happens to your community. That's how you make a difference. So what I found is that as a small business owner, by being involved, I started to have influence. By serving, I started to have influence in my community, and people started to respect me because I was willing to serve. In fact, most people are very busy with their lives, and so. They go to work, they come home, they don't serve their community. By not serving the community, they tend not to have an influence on what's going on in their community because they, come, they go to work, they come home, they spend time with their family. However, if you choose, and, and, you know, and I'm not sure if it's the same in your sense, but if you choose to get involved in your community and serve, then you can start to have influence in, in your own community and in the political process. Now, I'm, I'm suggesting that it doesn't have to be Republican or Democrat or, or not, but it has to be, it's that service in the political sphere that allows you to have influence because people are seeing you serve, are seeing you be involved. So that's what my, my point is. I, you know, oftentimes people will get lost in the, in the politics as um, you know, having control of where the government goes but it's it's not that obvious. It's you can be in politics at the at, at the local town level, and that is still politics. But it's it is um, it's not it's not a Republican or Democrat thing. It's not an unroll thing. It's it's just a matter of serving, and in serving, people see that you're doing your job, and if people respect you, you can then move up and have more influence in your community. So that's my okay, Lucy. Lucy. Yes. Okay. My question is about campaigning. Oh, okay. I know a lot about that. <laughs> I don't know if it's taboo or not, but um, as background, in some of our workshops this week, we've been oh, President Obama keeps coming up as someone who whose campaigns have been necessarily lofty and, yeah. and grandiose in, in order to inspire. Right. Um, and who we believe that may have a negative impact on the legacy that he leaves behind because he has this expectation and right. you know, this. Right. So it, it seems like an extremely sort of thin line to, to navigate. Right. And as someone who has campaigned often and, right. and won often, what would be your inside tips for? Well, I will tell you that, I mean, that's a great example um, because I think that there was no question that he was very inspirational. But when you put the bar here, and you deliver here, that you know you'll always you're setting yourself up for failure. You you create this perception that somehow you're going to give people this. I've always suggested that you if you it's better to say you're going to do this and then do this, and then people are like, wow, he did even more than I expected. I, I know that sounds crazy, but when you create this, I, I always tell people, listen. I don't know if I can or I can't, but I can tell you something, I am going to work very hard to make that happen. I am going to go out there because I care. And in, in that attitude, it's, it's that, it, I didn't promise anything, but what I said is I'm going to work hard. Now I know that I will always give that. I, I, I know that I can't promise you a result, but I can promise you effort. And so if people see the effort, even though they never saw the result, but if you tell them that this is the result, you if you elect me, you'll get X, Y, and Z, then you've created, you've created, you know, you set yourself up for failure. And it is it is a dangerous thing for a politician to do. Because eventually reality strikes. It is a lot easier to campaign than to govern. 
<laughs> I'm telling you, it is, it is amazing at, that I feel like you can go out there, and there's so many ways as far as campaigning, that, you know, things that you do that, that are successful. I, when I first started 16 years ago, I was, it was grassroots, knocking on doors, um, meeting people, bumper stickers, basic out there, you know, coffee parties. Now there's this whole new world of social media. And Barack Obama, the president, he figured that out. He figured a way to get into that world. I never did it. I, frankly, to be honest with you, I've been fortunate and successful in doing, without doing that. And just recently, now that I'm running for state senate, I've done the social media and I'm like, wow, I am amazed at how the, the power of the social media and how that can assist you in campaigning and how you can get your message out consistently and over and over again as opposed to the way that I was accustomed to doing it. So that evolves and changes that, that whole political process for those of you that are interested in, in campaigning. However, I say campaigning is, is a reality of life. I'm a business owner. My job was to get out there, serve people, and sell myself. And, and in politics, you're selling yourself to people to say that I'm going to do a job. Well, as a business owner, I did the same thing. It doesn't matter what you do. In many ways, a campaign is a very good, um, a very good tool in, in marketing yourself. But I do believe, and it's a, it's a great question, is, is be, be very mindful of creating an expectation is not, that is not a reality. Because um, at some point, yes, you'll get elected, but at some point, it'll come back. Because we're human beings. None of us have got it all figured out. And none of us are always right. I have been in for 16 years, and I'll tell you, I know that there's times that I knew I was right. And I'll tell you, I, there were decisions that I've made that over a period of time, I was like, hmm, that was, you know what? I see things differently today than I did before. Because when I was a business owner, all I saw was business. That was my that was my world. It was a myopic view of the world. And then all of a sudden, I had to see things. I had to see situations and circumstances that I never dealt with before. And then I had to understand, oh, I see why that's a concern now. And I didn't understand it. So that has to come into my equation now. And so when I... When you see things, and I'll give you just a quick example of something that, you know, uh, healthcare. Healthcare is a big topic here in Massachusetts, and, and, the, and, the, and the president um, had pushed for healthcare. And I think it's important. And I, I have in my area where it's more conservative, people are like, um, don't like the concept of big government, healthcare, and whatnot. And I come from a background where, where I, I think we have to be mindful and be careful of universal health care and the concerns of universal health care. Everyone gets health care because I, I, my concern is quality and affordability and, and all of those things. Um, however, and so I have people that you know don't want that at all. At the same token, being in my position now over the years, someone comes to me and they don't, can't afford health insurance. And they're at the door and I'm the hospital and they're sitting at the door and they're having a heart attack. Can I really say to them, you know what? You know what, sorry, you don't have health insurance. I can't give you. Now who of us here would say that? Not one, and I, and I, and I often challenge you know, those people who say to me now that they don't want to help. They don't want to, you know, that you know, people need to have, you know, take care of themselves. Well, sometimes people can't. And sometimes situations and circumstances happen in people's lives that that can't be the case. Now, it doesn't mean I say it, you can have the best health care at all costs, it doesn't matter, that's a right, and because what happens is, is when you have something and you don't, and if there's no cost, it's not used properly. It, it is sometimes can be abused, so we have to find that, that fine balance. But I also have a different and a better understanding now that knowing that, you know what, I know that not one of us in society, I, I'd like to think, says to that, that guy who's sitting on the street that says, you know what, I don't have health insurance and I'm, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm having a heart attack and I need help. We want to help that person. We, we want to, that's a, a responsibility we should have as a society. It's finding that balance of, of allowing and, and providing that service with, at the same token, not allowing people to abuse that. And basically, um, 
you know, drive up something that is very expensive and then it makes it harder for everybody else because what I've experienced in my, in my years in the legislature is the healthcare portion of our budget continues to grow and grow. Well, what happens when you do that? Everything else shrinks, public safety shrinks, education shrinks, other things, because you can only do so much. The sad thing about politics is it still all comes down to numbers. It's not always just about people. You know, I, I know, well, it's circumstances. The reality is, is that, and I, I serve on the Committee on Ways and Means. My, my job is, in the legislature, is dealing with budgets. And so we have X amount of dollars to spend here and X amount, of, and so you have to make hard, and hard and fast decisions. And so, so what I try to do is, how do you spend those dollars more efficiently, as opposed to inefficiently, and you know what, it's a right, and so because it's a right, it, it, you know, cost doesn't matter. Cost does matter. It matters in our own personal lives. It should matter in government. So that's uh, a, a, a long, and I, I kind of segued off the, the political question, but you got me going there. But it is, a, it's an excellent plan. I'm glad you asked that. It's, it is, be very mindful of creating big expectations. Yeah. Hi. Um, I went first run mm -hmm. in 98, I think. Yeah. Uh, you had no experience on politics, uh, on politics. Uh, but you managed to, to win your opponent, your democratic opponent. Well, what was your main case to one? Mm -hmm. And did you use the, this, the same case in 2004? No. Uh, when I first ran, I ran and, you know, simply because I didn't have, I didn't have um, experience to offer. What I had was something that I had as, as business. Honesty, integrity, hard work, and common sense. I believe I was successful in business because of those four basic principles. Honesty, integrity, hard work, and common sense. I still will use that principle when I'm running for, for office because I didn't promise the, those, those things I know I can deliver. I know I can be honest. I know I can work hard. You know, I know I can have integrity. I'm not telling them I'm going to do this. Now, at the time when I was running, and I kind of I joke about this often, you know, at the time it's like, you know, give the, you know, give the young kid a chance, you know, honestly, you know, and now, of course, I'm like, well, experience is very important. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm kidding. Um, it is, you know, people want, in my, in my experience, people want, experience is a good thing, and obviously you, you understand how things, things are, and people do feel more comfortable that you're going to be effective what you do, in what you're doing. But it still comes back to, can I trust you? Can I look you in the eye and do you think you're, I'm telling you the truth or I'm lying to you? And that's really what I try to share with people. I say, listen, you know what? I'm not saying I'm right all the time, but I'm saying I'm telling you that I will do the best I can and I will advocate for you. I'm just like you. I'm a small business owner. I live next door to you. I know what your concerns are. And if you give me this opportunity, I won't get lost up there. And I will tell you something that I've learned in politics is it's very easy to get lost in the world of politics. It, because what happens is you become a representative and then it's, you know, all of a sudden it's people that want, people that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in, in Boston, for, in my case, are, um, want something from government. So, so they're, by the nature, they want to influence you and if they want to influence you, they're nice to you. And I've run into a lot of my colleagues that it kind of goes to their head that, wow, geez, I'm really kind of important, you know? And, you know, geez, what did this place do before I got here, you know? <laughs> and it gets, they get lost in that, in that uh, of who they are. And one of the early advices, and, and pieces of advice that I got when I got into politics is understand that it's very important to stay in the, in the real world because when you go up to Boston, it's not the real world and everyone's nice to you, not because they really like you, but because you have influence. You're, you know, votes that you take in, can change things and so they want to influence you. So make sure you keep a foot in the real world. I've made sure that I've done that. I, I still wake up every morning at five o'clock in the morning and go to my gas station and do my paperwork and do a little bit of work before I go to the office. That has enabled me, in my, my opinion, to stay in what I call the real world and be and, and not get lost in the political world where you're you're there. So so in two thousand nineteen ninety eight I ran on those simple principles. I am I ran in oh four. I it was 
I, I still did that, but I tied in, the, you know, obviously the experience that I've done, the effectiveness, the way I've been able to do it. And it's a very difficult thing because by nature, I don't, it's hard, I don't like patting myself on the back, but in politics, you kind of have to show people what you've done. So it's really kind of, it, it's an awkward thing. Um, and you have to find that balance where people are, are happy with you that you're doing it without being, you know, uh, grandiose and like, oh, look how wonderful I am. And that's, that's a challenge. Um, however, this new, this election that I'm now, that I'm going for now, you know, for, which is a much broader area, and I'm new all of a sudden. I mean, I'm, I'm well known in my area, but there's new areas. And I'm going out there and I'm so and so. And I am reverting back to what I believe has been successful for me. And the reason that I think I've been successful in Beacon Hill is because of those very simple principles that I had when I was a, as a small business owner and as Vinny, the local business guy. I do the same thing up on Beacon Hill. And these people will all be, if you treat, treat people with respect, you listen to them, even if we disagree. But I've listened to you, we've heard it, and then I share with you, you know what? I understand where you're coming from, but let me tell you why, where I'm coming from. I've been given the opportunity to make my case, you've been given the opportunity to make your case, and somewhere in the middle we can maybe find some compromise. That's the art of good politics. That's what makes things, instead of, I'm right and you're wrong. And I, and I run to a lot of people in politics. That's the attitude. I'm right and you're wrong. And that's, um, you, know, by, you know, by nature, they philosophically, they believe in something. I try not to do that. I try to say, okay, let me just share with you why I think of what I have. I, you know, as a business owner, I see things differently than maybe a guy who's a union, you know, that's involved in the union. You know, just, just by the nature. You've got managerial, you've got, you know, uh, labor. And oftentimes, the business... Uh, business and, and labor will disagree on how we should do things. I believe that this, if the two of them come together, that the, the, the net goal can be very positive. And that's what I've tried to, um, that's what I've tried to, to do, is try to bring people together. So I'm running on the basics, the basics of that I see in integrity, that so I can pe hopefully win people's trust that, you know what, there's a reason that those people have given me 16 years and at the same token, I, I try to be a consensus builder. And that's something that I didn't know when I first ran. That's something that I, I didn't have as, as an experience, that now I have as an experience that I can show how, here I am, Vinny, local kid from the gas station, who can go up and work with the governor and the Senate president and the speaker and be effective and have relationships with these people and not be ignored like, you know, but just by the fact that I'm willing to work with people and build consensus. So that's kind of how I've, I've done that. It's kind of a long answer, but. Okay, Bernardino. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I would like to, to ask you if you, can you share with us uh, three or more apps that you think lead you to success? Apps? Habits. 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 Yes. Habits. Habits, okay. Um, One thing that, I, that I've done, which was, it wasn't in my nature, is I get up early every morning, <laughs> which is a very difficult thing because I never got up early before when I was in high school. But when I started my business, I had to. And what I found is, crazy enough, I got a lot accomplished early. And so I was able to get things you know, done. So I've been able to keep a business going and be a state representative for 20 something years and I think that because I get up early and, and get going there, um, I've been successful in that regard. So it's a very simple thing, um, but get up early and get moving, is, it's very important. I try to go to bed on time too. I need eight hours of sleep. Um, secondly, I listen. When, when I, as opposed to, and I'm obviously right now I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm talking a lot, but what I think that has helped me quite a bit to be effective is listening to people is to try to get a sense of it. Because people don't always, people want to talk about themselves. They want to tell you about their circumstances and situations. And so, where I'm a much better legislator today, I think, because I was, I listen, I listen to my people. I listen to other legislators who have been there. I, I think one of, the, one of the most important things that I did when I first got elected is I shut up and listened for, for probably a year and a half, two years. And I listened and I learned from other people who have done it. 
because experience is an important thing and you can learn from people. In the world of politics, it's very competitive. So what I would, you know, sometimes there are politicians that they don't want to share with you their secrets to success because they're in competition with you. <laughs> However, the neat thing is that there are always those people that are on their way out, that have done it and have been successful and now they're leaving. And they're the ones that are more apt to give you the wisdom of the years that they've had and that likability. So um, I was very fortunate when I came on to, to meet a few people that I knew that were in the end of their careers. And I just listened. How did you do it? I listened to their stories. I was interested. And I think those little, those little tidbits, you know, it's not all perfect, but those tidbits were very successful and very helpful to me, listening to the advice of, of older people. You know, and that's, that's just basic life. You know, I remember my parents, my parents always taught me to have respect for people that are, that are in authority, that are older. Um, it was, it was cult for me, that was very cultural. I think, we, I think we all come from the same culture, and so we understand that. That's not how it is here in, in America. I, I, I find that, that in oftentimes in America, people don't look to the elderly as, for advice. They think they know better, they're smarter, and, and whatnot. I've often, you know, I've been very successful in taking advice from people and, and frankly treating people that are older than me that are in other positions with respect even in the political process you know I always I, 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 I never look to people as you know if they're you know a representative a senator the speaker the you know a chairperson I you know I always address them just like when I grew up Mr. Mr. You know, Mr. You know, Smith, Mr. Jones, Mr. I always did that, and you know, some people, why are you doing that for? Don't call me that. It's like I always felt it was important to give people respect until they tell me that, hey, call me by my first name. But you show people respect. That I think is a, is a simple thing that my mother taught me that has helped me tremendously in life and clearly in politics, um, because people like it when you show them the respect. They make the decision where, you know, and I'm saying it's the way you call them. But people have a lot to offer. I've learned so much from people, and I'll give you one last thing that I, that I think in, in the legislative process, there's 160 legislators. What I did over the years is I tried to get to know every, there's 160 people, that's a lot of people. But over the years, I tried to find out something about every single person and have a conversation and build a relationship with that person. And I'm not saying we agree on it and things or other things, you know, but you build relationships and you get to understand. And what you do find in that area is everybody has a story. Everybody has a story in life and everybody has a unique story. And, when, and then you get a perspective of where they're coming from, why they are who they are. We have no idea where people come from. And you learn from people and their story. You learn to understand who they are and why they're, you know, why they may have some political preference or some other thing that, that's there. And I, you know, just so many different things that I, you know, by learning and asking them about their children, about their family, about, you know, growing up. Simple things like that. You start to, it paints a picture. And everybody's got a kind of a cool story, you know. And I, uh, I mean, I share my own story. Is You know, my grandparents, my, my grandmother came here in 19... 53. She came here. My grandfather was in the shipping business, and so he came by boat. She came by plane because for them at the time, financially, it was, um, you know, it was expensive. You had, she had seven children. My mother was the oldest, so all of her children stayed with my mother. She came by plane. My, my grandfather came by boat in 1953. She lands in America. She, I, I apologize. She lands in Lisbon and she's going to America and what happens is, is she finds out my grandfather died at sea they had to bury him at sea and now she's left Cape Verde she's got everything there and now her husband's passed away she's 53 she's, she's 40 it's 1953 she's 40 something years old and she has to make a decision to come to America and say okay I got to start a new life, and this is, you know, this is back in the 50s, and it was, you know, a lot of challenges. She went to America, started all by herself, got a job at a factory, and just saved up money, 
and brought one kid by one kid by one kid to the, to the extent that my, my youngest, my, my, the youngest aunt of my mother was nine years old. She basically grew up her entire life with my father and my mother. And eventually she was able to save enough money to get the last one there. Except now you think about a nine-year-old child who's grown up with, you know, with her, her, her sister and her husband her entire life, and we're going to put you on a boat, and we're going to send you to America to go to your mother that you have really hadn't really grown up with. I mean, it's pretty powerful things that people go through um, that really, to me, it was like, wow, would I have done something like that? Would I have, you know, I mean, in many ways you get comfortable in life, but the, 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 the risk that people took, and, and everybody, as I said, everybody has a really neat story. I, I guarantee that if, we have, if I talk to each and every one of you, there's something in your life that you can look to that has been unique, that has shaped you, that has, maybe it's bad, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's good, but it's shaped you. And so listen and learn from people and build relationships. Those relationships are amazing and they, they come back and, and, you know, I'm a Republican in Massachusetts. There is 30 Republicans, 130 Democrats. And I think that I've, despite my political philosophies, I think I get along incredibly well with everybody. I treat them like, even if they disagree with me, I think that I've built relationships and I like them because I don't, I'm not telling them I'm right and you're wrong. It's, hey, this is how I think and this is how you think and we disagree and let's try to find some common ground and we can work together. When you treat people with respect like that, you can be successful in whatever you do. That's in work, that's whatever you do. It's be passionate, care about what you believe in. I'm not saying, you know, give up your, but be respectful of other people. And you, I think, is one of the biggest secrets to my success that I've had as a person. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for sharing uh, with us this journey <laughs> to America. And uh, second round, uh, no, you, okay, you before before Lucy. Okay. Don't mind if I take my coat off. Get a little warm in here. Yeah. <laughs> Turn the heat. That's okay. Uh, I want to uh, wondering if uh, you, in, in, like a leader, if you have to do a heart speech with a heart uh, issue, like uh, immigrant policy in a Cape Verdean community. What is the strategy to make a good discourse? How, when I'm, when I'm speaking, mm -hmm. well, oftentimes when you speak, you know, it's from the background. Like, I share, you know, I can share my, my grandparents' experience. When, when you can share from your personal experience of, of something that's how it's like, that tends to be the most effective way of sharing and having influence with people. People tend to appreciate and like a story um, because they can relate and just try to find ways to relate. So if you're talking about immigrant, immigrant policy and how you do that, um, it's, I, can, I can share from my perspective, and, I, and frankly, I can be more compassionate because I understand. I know, what it's, I know what it was like for my parents, you know, in a sense, what it was like for my parents. I know what it was like for me as a young kid growing up and moving into a suburban community where no one spoke, uh, are you know Creole and it was all English and that's what we grew up in and we were clearly considered the outsiders um, and then eventually when people get to know you build relationships you say but I understand that philosophy so I think if I can bring that experience when I'm sharing that's helpful I, I think that that, that gives me um, some credibility when you're when you're sharing. It's a big topic here in this country, immigration policy and how it works. And, um, and, it, and it's a challenge because um, we've, we, we don't have consensus on how we're going to do it. And yet, you know, we're, it's in, this country was built upon uh, what I call a melting pot. People from all over the world have come to America and made America what it is. Very few people are American, but you know, but they come from all over the world. That's really what's made America unique. But how do you control that? How do you find it? Do we just take off the borders and say everyone can come? Is that possible? Is that feasible? I think the reality is, is that that can't be the case as much as some of us would like it. We know that you can't do that. We're having that issue right now on the Mexican border. 
There are people that want to come. Our standard of living, obviously, is higher. And so we have people that will do anything who will come to this country. Um, and yet, can you handle that? Can, can a country handle that? It's, it's a very bad, difficult, difficult, tough issue. And so we have people that are very anti-immigrant. And then we have people that are just you know, very pro-immigrant, and it's somewhere in the middle is the is the answer. And but what happens is is that the extremes tend to be what people hear, and it's somewhere in the middle is how we're going to solve this immigration issue in Massachusetts or in frankly in the nation. It's it's a big it's a very it's a very divisive issue in this country because if if oftentimes I see people that are they say that they're anti illegal immigrant. And it is the perception is that you're anti-immigrant, and well, that's that's us. We're all we're immigrants, so it is you know people will take that personally because they don't delineate or differentiate that, and they have to we have to find a way to have a conversation and understand the importance of immigration of immigrants to this nation, and yet understand that we have to have some level of a balance. We we can't just you know, we can't just to have no, uh, you know, border. I mean, I think every nation has some type of a, a, a policy in which they, of how they control and allow the immigrant population. I know when I went to Cape Verde, it was a big issue of some people that were from America that were being deported back to Cape Verde that never lived there, and then they're in Cape Verde, and it's become a problem for the Cape Verde community. And and so is that fear too? So it's how you find that, strike that balance. It's not easy. So, but. Okay, Lucy, unless there is someone, no, Lucy, go ahead. If I may change the topic. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, so, uh, say that you you are forced to move to Cape Verde for yeah. some reason, or you decide to move to Cape Verde, and you're taking with you all of the uh, experience and knowledge that you have about Massachusetts over, the, over a lifetime, really. Um, and now you're working for Cape Verde Cooperation, Cape Verde International Development, for example. Mm -hmm. What would be some of the low-hanging fruit that you would go after in terms of cooperation between Massachusetts, the state, and Cape Verde, the state? Hmm. Hmm. That's good. <laughs> um, you know, it, it is. I, I haven't given it a, a, a lot of thought, so I, I, I I'm not sure. But I, I think, in my experience that I've had in being, in being in America, going to Cape Verde, I would try to focus in a greater way of building, and I know there's a lot of business communities that are trying to work, in, in work to build relationships in Cape Verde and in America and, and whatnot. I think that for the Cape Verdean community, I, I've seen some real success. I think that you know we, we were talking about it the other day about this the educational standards, how they've increased the amount of people who have education. The the personal standards uh, have people's you know uh, living wages have increased um, dramatically. Um, I think that there are real there are a lot more opportunities that have not been tapped yet, and there are a lot of as as you know there are a lot more Cape Verdeans here than there are Cape Verde, and there are a lot of people who. Um, appreciate where they came from and they appreciate the culture that has made them who they are. You know, I think we're, you know, we all have a lot in common as Cape Verdeans and we care about our Cape Verdean counterparts. How do we, I would try to focus on tapping the Cape Verdean in America and tapping them to try to build a greater relationship with where they came from. There's a lot of people that I talk to, they're like, Oh, I would love to go back to Cape Verde, but they don't do it. So how do we find the, those people? So if it were me, I would try to build relationships in, in the communities I have and try to get them to be more, um, try to find, you know, get them to be more active in Cape Verde. For example, my cousin, he, you know, he's, you know, has came here a little bit after we did, but he got, you know, 
but he just loves who he is. He loves his Cape Verdean culture. So when he went, he has done well financially. He went and was in, you know, in Brava, that our family had had a home there. He went and has spent a great deal of money and redid the whole, you know, the home and, you know, made a few. And now he visits there all the time. And there are examples like that all the time where people can have that, build that relationship with, with their, with their country, you know, um, where they came from, where we're, I mean, that's our pride, I mean, that's who we are. So how do we, how do we build that relationship? I would focus on trying to tap the Cape Verdean community in America to have a stronger tie and relationship because I think it, it not only benefits us that are here, it will benefit the Cape Verdean community and will help um, expand your economic base. And if your economic base is doing well, I think you will all do well and you'll be more successful. I think this is probably a good example of it. I mean, I think the, the relationship with Dana Molafaria, um, I think a lot of this had, was born by a man who um, is proud of his Cape Verdean roots and where he came from and who, what made him. And he built this relationship with Cape, with Cape Verde and you've had this, uh, this building a relationship that you even have a, you know, a foundation here, right here at Bridgewater State. Um, those are the type of things that um, 